it's just amazing. It's been described as a big mosquito or dragonfly, and it's right. It's got all kinds of wings on it. It's an incredible sight. And then, of course, we flew right up to it, slowed down our approach rate so the two vehicles could be mated on orbit. Notice how the plumes can be easily seen, and the shuttle is still correctly exposed. Even the words Space Hub can clearly be read. If this image was captured using a long exposure, it would have looked like this. Evidently, it didn't take a long exposure to capture these engine firings, and therefore, it did not take a long exposure to photograph these faint but visible stars in the background. This confirms my findings at the Kulang Observatory. Even with a fast exposure, under good conditions, the brightest stars will still register on film. Only the dimmer ones will appear invisible. And yet, even the brightest stars are absent in the photos. Nor did any astronaut take the opportunity to increase their exposures for star pictures. Now, the fast exposure setting is a common response used by many to try and shoot down Casing's argument. However, there is another counterclaim used. On Apollo 16, an ultraviolet camera was allegedly brought to the surface of the moon. This camera recorded nearly 200 images showing views of the Earth and the star field in the ultraviolet spectrum. Propagandists love throwing these images at their audiences, stating that they thoroughly disprove Casing's argument. In reality, Casing had built his argument partly on these photos. On page 192 of the Desert Publications edition of his book, published in 1981, Bill Casing had this to say. The astronauts had a golden opportunity to take magnificent photographs of stars since there was not atmosphere on the moon to restrict or diffuse their light. And yet there is only one dim, somewhat blurred photo of stars taken with ultraviolet light sensitive film. Instead of taking the 600 pound lunar rover on three flights, a compact 600 pound astronomical telescope with suitable film could have been taken, thus assuring earthbound scientists with the best view of stellar bodies obtained to date. It seems that Bill Casing must have told this to Bart Sabrell, as he used this argument in his documentary, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon. While they took three automobiles to the moon, they never took a photographic telescope. Had they done so, they would have been able to see farther into the universe than had ever before been realized. If they had taken a telescope and were not actually on the moon, they would have had to concoct undiscovered galaxies that might one day prove to be non-existent. The cost of the three moon rovers in 21st century currency? Nearly 60 million dollars each. Though they had fewer parts than a jeep, where was all this money going? It's clear where Sabrell got the argument from. And it is clear that neither him nor Casing are talking about the UV photography. But, in his review of this movie, Jay Windley took the two out of context with the following. NASA knew they couldn't fake the kind of astronomy that could be done for the moon. That's why they never sent any astronomical cameras to the moon. If they published astronomical photos showing fake objects that were discovered not to exist, or failing to show objects that were later found, the hoax would have been revealed. Fine! Except that an astronomical camera was taken to the moon, and did obtain data that revealed new findings, and those findings are still accepted today, having been verified by other instruments. Even if we overlooked it, Sybil is stupendously ignorant of the facts. The premise is still flawed. If NASA had wanted to publish astronomy pictures taken in space, they could have taken pictures from Earth orbit. The only thing you can't see from Earth orbit, that you can see from the lunar surface, is the Earth itself from a distance. And Apollo 16 took just those pictures. Everything else looks the same once you're above the atmosphere. During our little debate, Windley made no secret of the fact that he has a copy of Casing's manuscript. 
So, he knows very well that these UV photos were not the star photos that Casing states were never obtained. As is evident throughout his entire website, Jay Windley routinely counts on the fact that the casual internet surfers do not have ready access to Moon Hoax research. This allows him to cherry pick and misrepresent conspiracy arguments, which he can then use to drive a wedge between conspiracy theorists and those who have not seen their evidence. Here, it is apparent that Windley has taken this approach yet again with the careless expectation that no one will have the time or resources to verify his claim. In any case, although these UV photos have been presented, the question must be asked. If all NASA needed to do was snap some photos from Earth orbit, as the propagandists repeatedly tell us, then how can the propagandists be sure that these ultraviolet photos were not taken from up there? After all, they insist that the UV star positions in the Apollo 16 photos are identical to those in a UV image taken from Earth orbit. As Keith Mays states on his website, NASA would only need to put up background photos of stars as photographed from Earth because that's exactly how the stars would look from the Moon as well. So, with this in mind, how do we know that NASA didn't simply snap some UV shots of stars from Earth orbit and then superimpose a fake image of the Earth into the image? Recently, it has been argued that if these images were taken from low orbit, the Earth's geocorona would have obscured most of the ultraviolet light and spoiled the shot. Yet, they would also have you believe that astronaut Michael Collins was able to snap up this ultraviolet photo from Earth orbit during his stand-up EVA on Gemini 10. When we compare these two photos, we can clearly see that neither of them show signs of obscurity as a result of the geocorona. If the Earth's geocorona would have spoiled any UV star photography, how could Michael Collins have obtained this image on his supposed Gemini flight? Furthermore, although many have argued that these UV photos from Apollo 16 match those perfectly from other sources, NASA had this to say on the camera's own web page. 178 frames were obtained, including data on the air glow and polar auroral zones of Earth and the Geocorona, and over 550 stars, nebulae, or galaxies. Note their choice of words. And over 550 stars, nebulae, or galaxies. The keyword is or. This is by far the most revealing statement in this entire scenario. What NASA is stating is that they are unable to distinguish the stars, nebula, and galaxies from each other. Out of all the thousands and thousands of photos, only 178 were taken showing stars. That's a little more over a quarter of all the missing video reels from Apollo 11. And not once did NASA attempt to take better photographic equipment to take pictures of the stars. The only telescopes brought aboard Apollo through which the astronauts saw stars were the ones installed aboard the LEM and CSM used for navigation. As Michael Collins states on pages 378 and 379 of Carrying the Fire, Toward the sun, nothing can be seen but its blinding disk, whereas down sun there is simply a black void. To see the stars, the pupil must be allowed to relax to open wide enough to let the starlight form a visible image on the retina, and that can be done only by blocking out the sunlight. In practical terms, that means putting metal plates over all five windows, and then pointing the telescope at exactly the right angle, an angle that is not only away from the sun, but which also does not permit any sunlight to bounce off the LM or CM structure into the telescope's field of view. And yet, years later, on Larry King Live, Buzz Aldrin had this to say about seeing stars through the CSM windows. And we can look out these windows and, and see the Earth drift by and see the moon drift what by. What did you see? And I saw a light out there, okay? This is after we had witnessed the upper stage rocket uh, next to us make an evasive maneuver to miss the moon. 
later missions that crashed into the moon so that we could uh, determine the seismic uh, effect of crashing so into the moon. So you saw a light. So we saw a light, and we thought, wonder what that is. You know, there are a lot of lights out there when you're not looking in the direction of the sun. There are a lot of stars, and they're all fixed relative to each other. Now, well, one unusual. of them starts moving, or it's moving, and we know that that's another object. It's not a star. Stars don't move. How long well, they move, but they're so damn far away that uh, we're not going to hold on. How long did it fall in? Exactly.